Good afternoon, everyone. As MPP for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes and Ontario's Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, it's an honour to welcome everyone to Brockville. We're so proud to have Prime Minister Trudeau, Premier Ford, Ministers Anand and, and Fideli, along with 3M Canada President Penny Wise to join us for this truly momentous announcement. I want to recognize Brockville Mayor Jason Baker and our local MPP Michael Barrett. Early on in this pandemic, Premier Ford pledged that Ontario's frontline heroes would never again have to worry about PPE supplies. When he said that, I knew 3M and our community could be a part of the solution. Today is a dream come true from those early days and ongoing conversations I had with the company and the Premier and Minister Fideli. We're sending a message to the healthcare workers at the three hospitals serving my riding in long-term care and to the staff on the front lines everywhere that we have their backs. 3M and its two production facilities have been a tremendous corporate citizen in Brockville for over 25 years. The Made in Canada solution we're announcing today is just another example of the company stepping up in a time of need. Now it's my pleasure to invite Penny Wise, President and CEO of 3M Canada, to speak. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Penny Wise, the President of 3M Canada. Today, I'm proud to be addressing you from 3M Canada's Brockville, Ontario location. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our distinguished guests today. The Right Honourable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. The Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario. The Honourable Anita Anand, Minister of Public Services and Procurement. The Honourable Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the MPP for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. The Honourable Victor Fideli, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Michael Barrett, Member of Parliament for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. And the Mayor of Brockville, Jason Baker. 3M Science helps advance every business, enhance every home, and improve every life. We are facing an unprecedented time, and the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting us all in some way or another. 3M is playing a critical role in the global response to the pandemic. As a science company, our technologies provide a wide range of solutions to help the fight against the virus. From protecting frontline workers by manufacturing PPE, to providing solutions like air purifiers that are helping in the development of a vaccine, we are using 3M science to fight COVID from every angle. Our highest priority is to keep our employees and the public safe. Now, we're taking another important step, a step towards protecting our heroic healthcare workers, our first responders, and those in essential infrastructure and industry roles who strive to ensure every Canadian's health and safety. I now have the honour of welcoming, welcoming to the podium the Honourable Vic Fideli, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister Fideli. Good afternoon. Today is an exciting day, not only for the people of Ontario, but for all of Canada and everyone around the world who knows that our province has set the gold standard for producing medical equipment. Since the beginning of this pandemic, you have heard about these masks on the news, the ones that keep our health professionals and frontline workers safe while they're battling COVID-19. The partnership we are announcing today between the federal government, the government of Ontario, and 3M Canada is significant. 3M, a global leader in PPE production, has selected Ontario as the strategic location for their new manufacturing facility. This new $70 million expanded facility will have the annual capacity for manufacturing millions of N95 respirators and the vital melt-blown filtration fabric to help service private sector, provincial 
and national market demand. And over the course of the five-year agreement, 3M will manufacture 50 million masks each year to meet domestic demand. Masks that will be shared equally between the federal and Ontario governments. This plant means jobs. It means a stronger supply chain and reducing our dependence on overseas suppliers now and in the case of future challenges. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our government has worked to leverage and expand our world-class manufacturing sector to meet the PPE demands for healthcare professionals, frontline workers, and other workplaces that need it. We launched the $50 million Ontario Together Fund to support proposals submitted through the Ontario Together web portal to help businesses retool their operations, develop technology-driven solutions and services for business to reopen safely. And we created a workplace PPE supplier directory with an up-to-date list of Ontario companies and business associations that are ready to supply PPE. With this exciting partnership, we are creating a Made in Ontario solution to ensure we can meet N95 mask demand and build a sufficient stockpile as we continue down the path of economic recovery. By continuing to work together to find solutions, with the help of the business and manufacturing sector, we will beat this virus and be ready for any future challenges we may face. And now we'd like to welcome our federal colleague, Minister Anand, to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's so good to see you all. I'm so pleased to be here. Welcome Prime Minister, Premier Ford, Minister Fideli, Minister Clark, and Ms. Pennywise. Thank you all for joining us here today on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. Depuis le début de cette pandémie, notre gouvernement a travaillé avec diligence pour s'assurer que les travailleurs de la santé de première ligne et les services essentiels disposent de l'équipement de protection individuelle et des autres produits vitaux dont ils ont besoin pour assurer notre sécurité à tous. Au niveau fédéral, provincial, municipal, tous les ordres du gouvernement travaillent à l'unisson pour une cause commune contre une menace qui ne reconnaît pas les juridictions ou les limites. At Public Services and Procurement Canada, we have pursued an aggressive and ambitious procurement strategy to sign long-term contracts in a hyper-competitive global market characterized by high demand across goods. We have focused on diversifying supply chains in order to procure multiple sources of PPE in this turbulent global marketplace. This strategy is producing results, as is evidenced by the orders and deliveries of PPE that Canada has secured to date. Canada has contracts in place for more than 2 billion articles of various PPE for delivery over the course of the current fiscal year. And in the months since we began to execute these contracts, we have received approximately three quarters of the face shields and surgical masks ordered, more than half the gowns, and more than 80% of the hand sanitizer. Over 44% of our contracts for PPE and other equipment by dollar value have originated right here in Canada with Canadian manufacturers. As health practitioners across the country will attest, N95 respirators have been a critical piece of PPE in fighting COVID-19. By working with a wide variety of international suppliers, we have to date received more than 61 million N95 and KN95 respirators. 
This amount includes up to 500,000 respirators a month from 3M's U.S. facilities. These deliveries are a testament to a productive and collaborative relationship between our government and 3M. Throughout this process, it has become evident that when it comes to long-term solutions to Canada's needs, domestic production is a reliable, important and effective solution, and one that must continue to be at the forefront of our minds from a procurement perspective. Il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. Mais nous avons fait d'énormes progrès grâce au sacrifice des Canadiens pour aplatir la courbe aux milliers d'entreprises canadiennes qui ont répondu à l'appel de réattuyer leur chaîne de production et de produire l'équipement et des produits essentiels. Et à la troite collaboration entre tous les niveaux de gouvernement à s'unir dans la lutte contre la COVID-19. This fight against COVID-19 will continue for some time to come, and we must be ready for the long term. I want to thank Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Ford sincerely for supporting the work that we are undertaking in procurement, and Penny Wise, the head of 3M Canada, from whom you've just heard, for her advocacy and commitment to bringing us all here today. Thank you so much. Merci. Megwetch. Now we will hear from Premier Ford. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back in beautiful Brockville, and I just love the people here. And as Mayor Baker knows, this is a community with a rich and proud history. I also want to thank the Prime Minister and Minister Anon for being here today. Thank you, Prime Minister, for supporting this critical project. I also want to thank Minister Fideli and Minister Clark for advancing this historic project along with their federal counterparts. I want to recognize Penny Wise and the entire team here at 3M for making today possible. Thank you, Penny. Folks, this is what we can accomplish when we work together, when we stand united as Team Canada. My friends, not long ago, during the darkest days of COVID-19 pandemic, every country in the world was left scrambling for critical medical supplies and personal protective equipment. There was a worldwide shortage. Canada was left at the mercy of other countries for the PPE we desperately needed. We were left in a terrible, terrible situation. And I can tell you, worrying about where we would get the next PPE shipment, that's what kept me up at night. And the terrifying reality is, at one point back in April, Ontario was left with less than one week's supply of N95 masks. We had less than a week's supply of N95 masks we needed to produce. Our nurses, supply our nurses and doctors who were treating COVID-19 patients. These heroes were putting themselves at risk. In the thought of running out of the protective mass, it was hard to imagine. My friends, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that the situation was desperate. But we stuck together, and all of Canada stuck together, and we got through the worst of it by standing united as a country. And as sure as I'm standing here, I can tell you, this will never, ever happen to us again. Back in April, I made a promise as your Premier. I promised you, I promised the people of Ontario that we would never, never again be left at the mercy of other countries for this critical PPE. I promised that we would never be in that position again. My friends, Ontario is a manufacturing powerhouse. We can build anything right here on our beautiful soil. And when things got ugly, we put out a call to Ontario businesses. We asked Ontario companies, please, if you can, retool your production, start manufacturing the PPE we needed. And the response 
was truly overwhelming. I have never been more proud to be Premier of this great province. Thousands of companies responded, and today Ontario is producing PPE for all of Canada. And we all know that the gold standard, the equipment we need to give our nurses and doctors that are directly treating COVID-19 patients include the 3M N95 respirator. And since the pandemic hit, these masks have been extremely hard to secure. The whole world wants them. But 3M Canada came through for Ontario. Earlier on, we worked with 3M to secure a critical shipment of N95 masks. We got through the worst of it. And since then, it's been all hands on deck to rebuild our pandemic stockpile. And that's why today, the announcement is truly historic. This is one of my proudest moments as Premier because today I know that Ontario will never have to depend on another country for the N95 masks we need to protect our nurses and doctors, our frontline heroes. Once the facility is operational, Ontario will receive 25 million N95 respirators every year. Having gone through the pandemic, having seen the worst of it, I know we can all appreciate how significant this is. This facility will produce N95 masks for Ontario and for all of Canada. And this wouldn't be possible without the Ontario government and the government of Canada coming together. Prime Minister, I want to thank you and recognize you and the Deputy Prime Minister for your unwavering support during the pandemic. People expected us to put our differences aside, to put the politics aside and work together. And that's exactly what we did. So thank you again, Prime Minister. My friends, we're not out of the waters yet. This deadly virus is still spreading around the world at a rapid pace. We can't let our guard down for a second. But with today's announcement, with the steps we have taken to enhance testing, enhance contact tracing, to retool Ontario companies to produce medical equipment, with the billions of dollars this government has spent to shore up our health system, to shore up our defenses against this deadly virus, today we can all rest assured that Ontario is prepared, that we will never be left without PPE we need. We will never leave our nurses and doctors hanging. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, 3M Canada. And most of all, thank you to everyone who stood with us. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'd like to introduce the Honourable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, partner with all, all Premiers across this province. And I can tell you folks, when we called the Prime Minister, not just myself, all Premiers, he stood up to the plate. He supported us. He was on the phone every single week asking, what do you need? How can I help you? And you wonder why I'm always up here praising him? Because he did an incredible job as Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister did an incredible job. So again, thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Doug, for those kind words and your partnership. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. It's always great to be here with friends, uh, particularly uh, you, Premier Ford, uh, but here as well with Minister Anand. We're also joined by Provincial Ministers Clark and Fideli, the President of 3M Canada, Penny Wise, and of course, Mayor Baker of Brockville. Right from the start of this crisis, our government has worked closely with the provinces and territories to get Canadians the support they need. Fighting COVID-19 is a Team Canada effort, and since March, we've shipped out millions of pieces of personal protective equipment to our provincial and territorial partners. Whether it's hospital gowns, gloves, face shields, or masks, we're working around the clock to help our essential workers. At the same time, 
we've invested in production here at home. Earlier this summer, we announced a contract with General Motors to produce 10 million face masks at their plant in Oshawa, items that are already rolling off the line. Not only does this create good middle-class jobs, it also helps ensure that we have the capacity to make whatever we need here in our own communities. And on that front, we have even more good news to share today. Today, I can announce that the Government of Canada and the Government of Ontario have reached an agreement with 3M Canada to expand their facility and make N95 masks right here in Brockville. The Federal Government will support 3M's capital investment by contributing just over $23 million, and the Government of Ontario is doing the same. Once it's up and running, this plant will deliver 25 million N95 masks each year to the federal government and another 25 million to the province of Ontario. As Minister Baines has said before, this is part of our Made in Canada plan to find solutions to COVID-19. This will keep our frontline workers safe and secure domestic PPE production for years to come. This facility will come online starting early next year. Aujourd'hui, je peux annoncer que le gouvernement du Canada et le gouvernement de l'Ontario ont conclu un accord de principe avec 3M Canada pour agrandir leur usine et fabriquer des masques N95 ici même à Brockville. Nos gouvernements soutiendront l'investissement en capital de 3M en versant un peu plus de 23 millions de dollars chacun. Une fois opérationnel, l'usine fabriquera et livrera chaque année 25 millions de masques N95 au gouvernement fédéral et 25 millions à la province de l'Ontario. Je veux être clair. On effectue cet investissement à long terme pour mettre en place une solution canadienne à la COVID-19. Notre objectif c'est de garantir la production nationale d'équipements de protection individuelle pour assurer la sécurité des Canadiens partout au pays. On veut aussi s'assurer d'avoir des masques N95 à notre disposition si jamais on est confronté à une autre crise de santé publique dans les années à venir. L'usine devrait être opérationnelle au début de l'année prochaine. Before we get to questions, I want to take a moment to once again thank Premier Ford for his collaboration on this project and on many other things. Today's announcement is yet another example of the important progress we can make by working together. Right across the country, different orders of government have worked hand in hand with one shared goal, keeping Canadians safe and getting our economies rolling again. And this announcement today is just another example of what we can do when we work together and focus on all Canadians. Ensemble, on effectue les investissements nécessaires pour protéger la vie de nos travailleurs de première ligne en Ontario et à travers le Canada. On continuera de travailler avec les provinces et les territoires pour apporter aux Canadiens le soutien dont ils ont besoin dans les semaines et les mois à venir. Merci beaucoup. The Premier and I are now happy to take questions from media. Thank you, Prime Minister. So we'll start on the phone. Just one question and one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Merci. First question, Lucas Meyer, News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, to the Premier first. Premier, you are obviously, as you mentioned, adamant in April that increasing production uh, as not to be beholden to international sources of PPE. Um, do you feel that this particular partnership came a little bit too late in your mind? And how much of it is in a response to kind of the ongoing tariff battle between Canada and the United States? Well, 3M is the gold standard when it comes to uh, the N95 masks. And we want to partner with the best and the, and the biggest. And obviously the most competitive, too. Uh, the, the 3M is a company that will stand behind their product. And I think this is going to be a great partnership between 3M, Ontario, and the government of Canada. And we're, we're very grateful that they're going to come here and they're going to create jobs right here in Brockville. And we don't have to rely on any foreign uh, country, any foreign government. And as I, I mentioned in my, my speech, 
you know, there were some tough times when, uh, Lucas, when you were asking me questions, you know, how many PPEs do we have and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you always ask me, did I, yeah, I lost sleep over that, but we came together. We came together as a province, we came together as a country. The Prime Minister stood up and said, how can I help you? Any way we can help you? And I'm, I'm grateful for that. So it's just amazing when we work together um, and we band together and we're all pulling in the same direction. Canada, Ontario, we're unstoppable uh, against anyone in the world. So that's why we're doing it. Thank you very much. Um, and Prime Minister, if I may, on another subject, uh, given the documents that were just released with regards to the Wee scandal, two uh, simple clarifications. Do you stand by your initial statement that you first heard about the rollout on May 8th when an internal email says the PMO is weighing in as of April 20th? And is it still is it your position that the scandal had nothing to do with Phil Morneau's resignation? Um, first of all, if I could uh, address the question of, uh, of N95 mask production, uh, it is obvious that uh, it is important for Canada to be able to rely on domestic sources of production. But one of the things that I know uh, factored into the decision of 3M to set up this manufacturing f facility is that uh, it also uh, is an ability to provide masks overseas as well. Uh, we will be able to cover domestic supply, but because Canada as a country has never brought in limits or protectionist measures on uh, ensuring uh, that our, projects can, our products can uh, help the world as well, uh, I know that was a, a part of the attractive nature of building this plant here to ensure safety for Canadians and safety for frontline workers uh, right around the world as well. So I'm extremely pleased to be able to uh, announce this today alongside Premier Ford. Um, in regards uh, to your uh, other questions, now remembering. Um, sorry, can you remind me what they were? It's about something far less important than N95 masks, I suspect. Do you stand by the original statement that you first heard about the rollout oh, yes, of the program yes, thank you. On, May, on May 8th? Yes. yes. Um, as well as at, the, the scandal that had anything to do with Mr. Monod's resignation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, as, as I said, uh, when I appeared at committee for 90 minutes, uh, I first heard of uh, the choice of uh, the WE charity to deliver this program on May 8th. Uh, I know there were uh, you know, conversations throughout government about that beforehand, uh, but the first I heard of it was on May 8th as being the mechanism to deliver this project, uh, this program. Uh, and uh, I wish Mr. Morneau absolutely nothing but the best in his future projects. Uh, the legacy that he has left behind of a strong economy of a Canada that is there uh, for Canadians, whether it's with uh, the strengthening of the Canada Pension Plan, whether it's uh, with the Canada Child Benefit, whether it's through the extraordinary emergency measures we put in over the past months to support uh, Canadian families, Canadian workers, seniors, young people, people with disabilities right across the country. Uh, these are all things uh, that Bill was extraordinarily instrumental in. Uh, and as we look towards the recovery phase, uh, his decision to not run again in the next election meant that this was a natural time uh, for a shift in that position. Uh, but like I said, it's been a privilege to work with him, and I look forward to tackling these next challenges uh, with an extraordinary team, including uh, Minister of Finance, Christia Freeland. Thank you. And we'll, next question, please, operator. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Harrison Lohman. TV Ontario. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for the uh, Prime Minister, please. Go ahead. Prime Minister, I was, reading a, I was reading a Toronto area Liberal MPs newsletter the other day, and uh, it quotes you as saying, this is in regards to COVID spending, we took on debt so that individual Canadians didn't have to. And I'm just wondering, trying to get a better understanding of how you view debt. Isn't debt taken on by the government a euphemism for debt taken on by each and every uh, Canadian taxpayer? When this COVID crisis hit across the country, people were told to stay home. People were told to not go to work. And uh, even though uh, many people uh, were able to turn or would have been able to turn to EI, we knew that millions of Canadians would be left without a source of income to pay their groceries, to pay their rent. That's why the federal government stepped up. 
with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit to make sure that people could continue to support their families and put food on the table. If the federal government had not done that, people would have had to max out their credit, credit cards, people would have had to uh, make, uh, you know, borrow loans uh, from the banks if they were lending them, they would have had to find ways to work under the table or work in unsafe conditions so that they could continue to feed their family. Well, that was unacceptable to us as an option. That's why we told people, stay home. Let's slow and stop the spread of this disease, and we will be there as a government to support you. We will be there to make sure you can continue to put food on the table, that every step of the way, we will have Canadians back, and that is exactly what we did. Now, the federal government actually uh, borrows at interest rates far lower than individuals on their credit cards or even provinces are able to. So the best way to ensure that Canadians could continue to support their families while they were hunkering down was to ensure that we could put money in their pockets, and we did. On top of that, the historically low costs of borrowing, the historically low interest rates, meant that there is no question that this was the right thing to do, to be there to support Canadians concretely so we could stay safe and we could preserve our economy enough to be able to restart it as we are looking at now. But indeed, there are people out there who say we shouldn't have done that. And that's part of the choice that Canadians are going to be facing in the coming months. Our government is going to continue to do two things continue to stand for Canadians, to be there and have people's back. And we're going to put in place the measures necessary, not just to return to the status quo, but to build back better. That will be an ambitious plan for the future of the country that recognizes the vulnerabilities that COVID has exposed and will demonstrate our ability, our capacity and our intent to support Canadians through this and build an even better future for them. But of course, that is why we're going to be putting this plan before Parliament. And there will be no doubt important debates to be had with parties who don't think we should be doing as much as we will be doing. And I look forward to those conversations. Can I follow up? Thanks. Uh, another question for the Prime Minister here. Uh, this week in Australia, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, after initially saying vaccinations in this country should be mandatory, the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, he actually backtracked on those comments after what we can assume was some pushback. I'm wondering um, if you were following that and what you made of that whole affair in terms of how governments respond to these things. Uh, I haven't been uh, following the details of uh, domestic debates in, in other countries on, on issues like this, but I can tell you that here in Canada, uh, people have been uh, extraordinarily successful in the way we've made it through so far this pandemic because they've listened to scientists. They've listened to doctors. Vaccines keep people safe. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the medical experts and the professionals and the doctors uh, who demonstrate that every single day. And I know that the way Canadians have stepped up on social distancing, the way that Canadians have stepped up uh, in terms of wearing masks, the way that Canadians have stepped up to keep themselves, their loved ones and our frontline workers safe is part of the story that we can be so proud of here in Canada, why all orders of government have come together and Canadians have come together to manage this pandemic better than many of our neighbours. And in order to continue doing that, we will continue to rely on the advice and the counsel of our top scientists and doctors. And of course, that includes uh, making sure vaccines are there for everyone. Merci. Prochaine question. Operator. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question. Christian Noël, Radio Canada. À vous. Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Bonjour, Monsieur Ford. Bonjour tout le monde. Écoutez, M. Trudeau, j'ai une question à vous poser concernant la prorogation et les nouvelles prestations de relance économique. Vous dites que c'est urgent de modifier le système, mais en même temps, vous ralentissez l'adoption avec une prorogation. Donc, si votre gouvernement tombe, qu'est-ce qui est en place pour protéger les Canadiens? Je peux être très, très clair que rien lié à la prorogation, prorogation va ralentir notre capacité de continuer d'être là pour les Canadiens. 
Nous avons fait une promesse euh, très tôt dans cette crise que nous allions être là pour appuyer les Canadiens, appuyer les familles, appuyer les travailleurs, appuyer les petites entreprises, nos aînés, nos jeunes, les gens vulnérables. Et c'est exactement ce que nous avons fait et c'est ce que nous allons continuer de faire. Mais nous devons reconnaître que le discours du trône qu'on a présenté il y a huit mois, qui ne faisait aucune mention de COVID-19 ou de pandémie, n'est plus aligné avec ce qu'un gouvernement doit faire maintenant pour la situation actuelle et pour les mois et les années à venir. C'est pour ça que c'est la chose responsable à faire de présenter au Parlement un nouveau plan, un plan ambitieux pour la relance économique, un plan ambitieux et audacieux pour protéger les Canadiens et qu'on s'assure qu'on a le soutien du Parlement pour ce faire. C'est un principe démocratique de base et nous allons toujours s'assurer qu'en même temps qu'on fait face à une crise, nos principes de démocratie sont bien respectés. One of the things that is absolutely clear is that the uh, throne speech we put forward eight months ago uh, is not uh, aligned with the reality people are facing today. There was no mention of COVID-19 or pandemics in that approach. And what this pandemic has revealed is challenges and weaknesses that can Canadians are facing that need to be addressed. However, it would be irresponsible for us as a government to take a new tack, to put forward an ambitious plan for the future of this country and to support Canadians without presenting it to Parliament to ensure that we have the support of Parliament moving forward. That's why prorogation is a logical and reasonable step as we concentrate on the next steps in keeping Canadians safe. There will no doubt be disagreements and debate in Parliament on the best way to move forward. I look forward to those debates because I know that what Canadians need is a government that is looking hard at the weaknesses that we've seen revealed because of COVID, but mostly how we build back better as a country. In suivi, Christian. En mettant un peu les, au défi les partis d'opposition de voter contre cette aide-là dans un discours du trône, vous êtes en train d'injecter de l'incertitude dans les foyers canadiens, dans l'économie canadienne. Est-ce que ça va pas contraire à une relance? Euh, au contraire, je pense que les foyers canadiens, les Canadiens ont vu que euh, tous les différents euh, paliers de gouvernement et les différents partis veulent la même chose, c'est-à-dire de bien protéger les Canadiens et d'assurer une relance économique solide. Et je pense que les Canadiens peuvent avoir confiance que la préoccupation première de ce gouvernement et j'espère des autres partis, c'est toujours le bien-être des Canadiens. C'est pour ça que ce qu'on met de l'avant en termes de discours du trône va démontrer notre euh, engagement envers un meilleur avenir pour tous les Canadiens et que cet aspect de prorogation euh, n'affectera en rien l'aide qu'on envoie actuellement et qu'on va continuer d'envoyer aux Canadiens. Hello. Sorry, uh, Ron Zajac with the Brockville Recorder and Times, Post Media. Actually, my question would be for Premier Ford, uh, because it concerns local government and, and its interactions with, uh, with the provincial government. Uh, the mayor of Brockville recently expressed his appreciation for the emergency restart funding uh, in Brockville to the tune of $1.3 million. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Brockville and other municipalities are faced with other uh, mounting uh, cost pressures. In Brockville, for instance, there's a police uh, shortfall because of having to man the COVID-19 testing center. As there's talk of a second um, intake or second wave, if you will, um, it's an unfortunate term for it, of this funding, uh, can you tell us more about when this second round of emergency restart funding might be flowing and what criteria municipalities might have to fulfill to, to apply for it? Well, first of all, I, I want to congratulate uh, the mayor of Brockville uh, when I was reading my notes, they, they ended up with a surplus. So anyone with a surplus because he, he ran an efficient shop, in my opinion, should be getting more, not, not less. But since it's uh, the minister's responsibility, I'll hand it over to Minister Clark. This, is, uh, this area is well known. He was, I think, the youngest uh, mayor in the country at the time. So I'm going to hand it over to Minister Clark. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Premier. Thanks for the question. Uh, our focus uh, as a government, obviously, was uh, was to negotiate the agreement uh, with the federal government. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Prime Minister and also the Premier for uh, this uh, historic agreement. Uh, we wanted to make sure that prior uh, to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference uh, this week, that we provided our initial uh, response to, uh, to uh, our municipal partners. Uh, that's why we, uh, we, uh, I sent them a letter last week indicating uh, the initial uh, dollar figure that they would be given as part of the Safe Restart Agreement. We obviously now want to turn our sights to uh, some of the individual expenses that uh, municipalities have as a result of COVID-19 and also allow them uh, to put a plan in place for uh, when uh, the second wave uh, hits us. So we'll be continuing to consult with municipalities. We created a technical table with my Deputy Minister, Kate Manson-Smith, the Association of Municipalities in the City of Toronto. We're going to continue to track COVID-19 uh, related expenses and we'll have more to say to our municipal partners in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. My question is for both the Premier and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, it's concerning um, the events happening in Caledonia. Uh, people are worried. They're wondering if you guys are taking it serious because this could, they're saying this could become another Oka or Ipperwash. Uh, Mr. Premier, you said that uh, you would come out swinging if uh, a conflict erupts there between the police and the people of Six Nations. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, your ministers have agreed to meet with these people. So why are the both of you not on the same page here? Because, like I said, people are wondering if you're taking it serious. We know that reconciliation is something that matters to all Canadians, and all orders of government have the responsibilities to war that. I'm very pleased with the work that, uh, that uh, Ministers Bennett and Miller uh, have been doing in this situation, uh, engaging, listening and working together. But I also know that the province is taking this very seriously as well. Uh, we need to come together to find a peaceful resolution for this uh, that involves the entire community. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to work seriously on finding the right path forward uh, for everyone in the region. Well, my friend, I, I appreciate the question. I'm just, I'm just going to correct it a little bit. Uh, I believe in collaboration. I instantly called Chief Hill. Uh, we have a phenomenal relationship with the Indigenous community, First Nations right across this province. I've supported them every step of the way, and I'm going to continue supporting them. Uh, what I did say yesterday, and I'm, I'm dead serious, uh, anyone who wants to come after our, our police officers, and I'm not saying just the Indigenous community or anyone else, they want to throw rocks at our police officers, they want to throw outhouses over a bridge and almost kill someone, uh, yes, absolutely. It's my job as Premier to protect everyone, all 14.5 million people, including the Indigenous community and, and our police officers. So I stand by uh, my comments, but I'm a strong believer in collaboration, in sitting down, communicating. And as I mentioned to Chief Hill, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, I sat down in my office, called him in immediately, and we had a phenomenal uh, uh, conversation on how we can work together and support each other. He was mentioning to me, he goes, uh, Premier, I, I need clean water. That's not a problem. Let's sit down and talk about it. You need clean water? I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Prime Minister agrees. We need to supply clean water. I will do whatever it takes to support the Indigenous community, and I think our track record shows that, and uh, not to mention Greg Rickford, in my opinion, is uh, the best minister I've ever seen when it comes to Indigenous affairs. So by all means, we're going to continue supporting the community, but uh, it doesn't matter uh, who you are, where you're from, whatever you're doing, you come after the police, you're darn right I'm going to protect our police. Thank you. Thank you. It's like you already know I'm asking a question to you, Prime Minister. Stephanie Levitz, the Canadian Press. I'd like to go back to your announcement, your government's announcement of yesterday. Um, you, your finance minister, your new finance minister, and Minister Qualtro said yesterday that this new plan um, to replace CERB is to, you know, you wanted to announce it so people can have assurances that they will receive help, millions of people. So why didn't you introduce this bill before you prorogued Parliament? I think one of the things that we know uh, is that Canadians need support through this very difficult time, and we're going to continue to be there. Uh, we recognize that over the medium and long term, uh, we need to move people off of the CERB onto 
EI, but of course uh, only a portion of Canadians actually qualify for EI. We need to make sure that anyone who has lost their job, who can't find their job, particularly because of COVID-19, gets the supports they need. Now, the EI system, different from CERB, has many elements to it that uh, support working while on claim, that support uh, training, support programs, uh, that make it a better support for a restarting economy than a CERB would. Uh, so this transition is going to be done responsibly. We're going to take the time to do it right. Uh, and as I said, uh, nothing around prorogation interferes with our capacity to support Canadians to continue to have their back through this difficult time. But as the follow-up then, no one's necessarily disagreeing with the premise of the need for the program. You've turned it into a political football. You could be introducing it now and getting the groundwork being laid now so people actually have the assurances they want, as opposed to wondering if the government might fall and they go into an election. No, we are uh, moving forward on implementing this program because, as we've always said, we are going to be there for Canadians. We can do this by regulation. We can do this with the tools we have right now at our disposal, and that is always our focus. At the same time, however, I think it's really important that as we move forward with a new and ambitious plan to rebuild our economy, to build Canada back better, taking into account all the vulnerabilities, I think it is only responsible that we check that we have the support and confidence of Parliament. The last throne speech we gave, which set the direction and the tone and the approach of this government, did not make any mention of COVID-19. It would be irresponsible for a government to move forward in a whole new direction without checking in uh, with Parliament to ensure that we have the support moving forward for a bold new direction for Canada. That's why a prorogation is important. And I think Canadians can be confident when they look across party lines that everyone seem serious about supporting Canadians. There's different approaches on how to do it, different perspectives on how much to do. But I think Canadians have seen from us that we will always be there for Canadians. We will have your backs. We will be there to support whatever it takes. Other parties might not believe that, might not agree with that, and I'm sure there'll be important debates around that, and I encourage those and welcome them. But there is no question that if we are to set off on this bold new direction for a country, we need to check in with Parliament. That's part of our democracy, and I think that's what Canadians expect. Hi, Prime Minister. Mackenzie Gray with CTV. Uh, I understand your position about needing a reset of Parliament and wanting a speech from the throne, but I don't understand the need to prorogue Parliament at this point in time and then two days later announce a $37 billion program, something that the opposition parties have generally already agreed on with passing CERB through unanimous consent for the most part. Why did you prorogue Parliament and then just quickly after announce a, a major program? Are you not playing hardball with the opposition parties, forcing them to vote on a speech from the throne and potentially forcing an election with no Serb or other help for them on the other side of it? If uh, the other parties disagree with extending the CERB or getting people on EI, they need to say that. But as you said, we uh, know uh, that other parties have seriously uh, have, have, you know, said and supported the fact that we need to continue to support Canadians. And we're not going to slow down on making sure that the millions of Canadians who are out of work and looking for work continue to get the support they need. I think that is absolutely essential. We are right now uh, focused on uh, creating uh, that throne speech and the new plan for moving forward uh, for the country. Uh, we're doing that uh, in a way that is responsible, uh, even as we ensure that Canadians continue to get the support, because we made a commitment to have people's backs, and we will continue to do that. David Aiken, Global News. Uh, a question about schools for both uh, the Prime Minister and the Premier. Uh, Prime Minister, I think earlier this week you, you mentioned that your family is still trying to figure out whether or not the kids are going to go back to school. you got the Premier right here. What can he say to help you with that decision? And for the Premier, yesterday I saw there was some uh, more money for police officers. Terrific. How about more money for teachers, more money to expand uh, facilities and classrooms? Maybe I could hear both of you on that one. Thank you. I think like many parents uh, across the country, uh, as we're looking at the approach of uh, the beginning of the school year, uh, we're asking lots of questions about how to make sure our kids are going to be safe, 
uh, as they hopefully start up school again. And uh, there's a lot of reflections on what schools' individual plans are that I'm looking at as parents. Uh, but in terms of federal government, uh, even though we have uh, no responsibility over uh, the provincial uh, education system, uh, we are going to continue to be there uh, to work hand in hand uh, with the provinces, as we did on the, on the Safe Restart Agreement, uh, on initiatives and matters that matter to Canadians. Uh, I think it's extremely important that everyone uh, recognize how important it is to get kids back to school safe, to keep them safe, uh, and I know that all orders of government are focused on uh, working together to do just that. Well, th thank you for the question uh, regarding getting more teachers. That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we put $30 million in to hire more teachers. Uh, the unions were asking us, do they have access to the reserves or, as I say, the rainy day fund? Uh, we gave them permission to uh, access the reserves. And it's great news. I want to thank the Toronto District School Board for getting the deal done. We have uh, close to 70% of all the school boards have a plan. They're engaged. We're going to move forward. Uh, we're pouring money into the system, and all you have to do is, I, I think one of the media outlets put a report card together, what our province is doing compared to all the other provinces, it's night and day. But our number one priority, and I know it's the Prime Minister's number one priority, to make sure that we have a safe environment, not just for our children, but for the educators as well when they go back. And I, I want to thank the teachers uh, for stepping up and, and doing a great job throughout this pandemic. Thank you.